So, you have a tent and a rig, and you love overlanding. You have plans to do it big, on the trails and some super glamping? Want ideas, tips, news, and reviews? A podcast that's first rate and here just for you? You don't have to think about it. Join us and be about it. Something interesting? We want to hear about it. Come on, let's talk about it. Welcome to Waypoint Overland's Random Waypoints Podcast. Sponsored by Midland. Communication for every adventure. The industry leader in radio communication technology and innovation for over 50 years. Sponsored by MyMedic. Sponsored by Tembo Tusk. Always remember, the opinion you follow should be your own. Just consider the things stated here to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. All right, Mike, I'm glad to have you back. For those of you who didn't watch last week, this is Mike Ladden from Drive the Globe, who will be a reoccurring uh, host of this podcast, giving his insights and his experiences, which are a lot. Um, welcome back, Mike. Thank you, Phil. I am uh, coming here live from Zoom, I guess. And uh, I'm currently in Montrose, Colorado. Uh, sort of recovering actually from uh, last week's Overland Expo. So I, you know, yeah, it was a busy week. Uh, actually, a busy couple of weeks for us, right? So with, with that, that's a real good segue into let's let's just uh, let's cover the last couple of first um, the last couple of weeks. How about that? Yeah. Um, we went to Overland Expo, right? Uh, Overland Expo West. Uh, well, we met up in Mexican hat for yep. my little rendezvous and we did our very first podcast together, which um, got a great response from and regardless of a response or not, I enjoyed doing I, I loved the location I loved who I was doing it with. So just want to put that out in the air. Super um, great location. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed doing it up there too. Uh, the scenery down there in Southern Utah is fantastic. It was the perfect intro uh, pre-game, if you will, going into Overland East because, you know, as everybody out there probably knows, the Overland Expo is just such an enormous event at this point. Uh, it was great to sort of go to Mexican Hat and get a couple days of, well, I don't know if we could say rest and relaxation because we had lots of great conversations <laughs> around the campfire late at night, but uh, it was, it was, it was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And just briefly before we leave that, I just, um, we, we were remote, but this was not an unachievable place to get to. And I just wanted to let people know that uh, we were very close to Gooseneck State Park. If, you don't want to uh, find a campsite. There are formal campsites that are not that far away. And the route we took was through the uh, Moki Dugway Scenic Byway, which is a beautiful drive. It's a switchback and the views are excellent. And we didn't stay at Muley Point, but we were at Muley Point. We were okay. just not at formal campsites. So if people are interested in what they saw last week on the podcast, um, one, it's achievable, uh, and it's a known place. You, you do have to do a little research to find our particular campsite, but it's not that hard. Right. Correct. Um, also, I want, want to um, speak a, a little bit more about the area because people, we're going to talk about Overland Expo, and uh, it's already over. So now anybody interested would be going next year and maybe they want to come through this area and i just want them to know that um it's not just that camping site there are a lot of things in that area you don't have to choose that you could um decide decide, decide to stay um where monument valley is if you like um there are many different monuments i think it's near four corners monument um 
well, Valley of the Gods. You got Valley the, of the Gods, Canyonlands. You're a yep. couple of hours drive from Moab. So the whole region is worth the trip. With that, I want to get right into Overland Expo with you. Uh, well, let's start the day before, which it's part of Overland Expo, but it's the day before the actual event. Um, you can arrive on Wednesday in downtown Flagstaff for their uh, gear and beers. Is that what it's called? Gear and beer. Yep. Gear and beer. And um, we decided to attend that. And I'm very glad we went. It turned out to be fun. It was uh, fun. It supported the local downtown businesses. And uh, we actually met a bunch of people down there. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was good. It, I think it's great interaction between the community and Overland Expo that, that takes place you know, every year in that area. So, I mean, I think that's, it was a positive thing. Yep. Um, I, I met some people through you at this at downtown, uh, the Wanderbox uh, crew. Yeah. Um, I love those guys. I yep. love those guys. I'm confident I'll see them somewhere sometime down the road, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, yep. So we, we did the beers and gears. It was basically a big party in the street. We also ate at one of the weirdest restaurants I've ever gone to in my life. Uh, <laughs> I, would, I would second that because uh, it's the first time we've ever done what did we do go th through an alley through a mall uh through a lingerie store to get to the restaurant or something yeah like it was kind of like from the top you went in you went down the stairs it was like going through a department store it was like you know yeah i wish i could like eating in the back of nordstrom's yeah <laughs> I wish I could remember the name of the place because it, I, I, um, the food was okay. Yeah, it was definitely <laughs> different. And we actually had plans of where we were going to camp that night, but we didn't need those. And you said we probably wouldn't need them. Uh, yeah. We got invited to a couple of uh, different things, but we chose to hang out with Wanderbox and some other people. And uh, we ended up having a party all night in the forest. Yeah, in the forest down <laughs> south of uh, south of Flagstaff there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, which leads us to the next day, which is Thursday. Uh, what do you think about the new setup going to uh, the separate location? Because me personally, I was kind of like, why are they sending us here? But it worked out very smoothly. So they knew what they were doing. Yeah, I think uh, from past experience, the uh, expo has struggled with moving people in. So Thursday's move-in day, right? And they've struggled with uh, getting such a large volume of people into an event site. Uh, everywhere from, you know, the pedestrian kind of people that come in for the day on the buses was a disaster in past years. And even for folks like us that were coming in under uh, instructor or media passes, it was challenging. So they, they put us off-site. Uh, to check in at the uh, Double Tree, which, by the way, Phil, we forgot to get cookies. Like we went to the Double Tree, shouldn't we have gotten the chocolate chip cookies? <laughs> I didn't miss them because of the good cookies uh, that we ate later. That's true. That's true. But uh, anyways, it was offsite, and my initial impression of that was, it was I'm like I didn't think that was going to work. Uh, it was a little bit of a rigmarole, but it turned out it was uh, clearly at work because it, it was it, it went. Super we were small. literally in and out in minutes. We we yep. had nothing to do for hours. Remember? Oh, yep. <laughs> yep. So um, the next thing I noticed was that the next day when I'm sorry, when we finally got there, uh, when the buses were running. They said that the buses were going to be running and they were running like uh, very regular. They were regular and they were early. Yeah. Where so, I was camped, in, well, we were camped there by the uh, uh, showcase vehicle uh, section, which was right by the entrance is where the bus drop off came and the buses were, were landing every. And I and one after another and they started right up at uh, no break it was 8 a.m and it was people were pouring in incidentally i got some of the stats back and um yeah. it was the largest friday attendance yeah 
which was very obvious from the naked eye, in my opinion. We talked about that. Uh, usually Friday is a busy day, but it seems like uh, it's felt like a Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. And the total attendance that they released yesterday, I think that uh, was 28,000 for the for the weekend. So it was a strong showing for sure. Yes. Yes. So this thing is absolutely growing every every year um the food you know i was going to talk about food <laughs> <laughs> i would hope so because if you weren't i was going to bring it up <laughs> um let's talk about the vendor's food first yeah uh, excellent they had a variety of food there were there were choices uh yeah. there were lots of choices and there was food in different areas. So yep. Yep. you, you, uh, even though you might be in a line, you weren't, you didn't feel compact. I don't, I didn't count, but there were a lot of food trucks, uh, uh, circled around both by the, I call it the, the, you know, the central point where the classrooms are, where the, you know, the parties were at nighttime, the happy hour. And then there was food trucks that were kind of more centralized that were closer to where I was parked or, or the other side of the vendor area. So they were, they were spread out in different places. And yeah, I mean, some, some at different times had lines at them, but you could always, if you, if you needed to eat and you needed to get to your next class or something, you definitely could. So, and that's what I liked about it. And I want the audience to be clear on something because the word food truck can be a misnomer for some people. I ate Thai food, mm -hmm. I ate barbecue, I ate seafood. So don't, yeah. don't think just hamburgers and fries, which they did have. Yeah. Uh, they had a multitude of different ethnic foods and everything I ate from a vendor was good. Yep, me and too. I would not say that if it was not. <laughs> no, Thai, we went back to, I went back to a couple of times. The Thai one was really good. Yes. I, yeah, there was a couple barbecue. There was pizza. There was, uh, I don't know. There was there was all sorts of different options. So good Mexican, pizza. Mexican, good pizza. Yep. 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 Because they they always got pizza, but it's not always good pizza. Because because right. we had some bad pizza. Oh yes, we had <laughs> bad pizza. Oh Mexican hat. Let's yes. stay out of that. that. Was that was worse than the worst frozen pizza I've ever had. <laughs> um. We had an opportunity to walk through the camping area, the VIP and the VIP Overland Experience camping, yeah. which is uh, basically an upgrade somewhat from the, the rustic camping. Yeah. And uh, I was actually impressed. I would, I would not have had any issue camping there. Okay. Seems like there was a lot more space. Um, and they had their own little uh, like happy hour area or lounge area. So I really like the upgrades that they made for the camping. And for those of you that are looking to potentially go next season, I would highly recommend getting the VIP pass or getting the Overland Experience pass for the weekend. Uh, the location of that, like Phil said, was it was was much better, much closer. Uh, really nice in there. They had, by the way, they had hot shower. They had a the hot shower. Uh, you know, I call them the wedding wagon trucks, and. Um, yeah, it, it even smelled good in that forest. So every time we walked I in, I agree. There... <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Uh, what was that pine? Is that a pine forest or a spruce forest? I think it's a pine forest. Yeah, pine. Yeah. Um, what did you think about the vendor area? We walked through through the vendor area extensively on Friday. What What did you think about the vendor area? Is this the part where Mike goes off the rails on the podcast <laughs> and says what he thinks? <laughs> you're allowed to go any direction you, you like, Mike. Um, the no, reason I why I asked you was, is um, there were new products, but the thing that stuck out to me was there was a lot of versions of the same products mm -hmm. than last, uh, than other years. Yeah. Uh, there were more, more, let's say tents or, yeah or uh, lockers or whatever. It was, it was more of the same as well as new products. And yeah. And I think there were what, 400 plus 410, 420 vendors, something like that. There was definitely more than 400. I'm, I'm yeah. confident of that. Yeah. So where I was leading with that is, I think that's good for uh, 
people who are putting together their rigs to have so much competition out there. So right now I feel like it's a good time um, for innovation. Mm -hmm. It's a good time for uh, pricing. The only thing is availability because everyone I talk to still is having uh, supply issues, no matter how good their product is, yeah. especially if it's uh, American made, right. having a lot of issues with um, supply yeah. chain. But other than that, the opportunities for people who are looking for this gear, this is an opportune time. If you want to build out a rig or find gear for your truck or for camping or for traveling, uh, there's probably no better place to go. Not at all. I mean, the, the, op the options are endless. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I can give you the negative side of it later or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but if you are looking to whatever that is, purchase a rooftop tent or uh, find some, um, you know, uh, track boards or, or cooking gear or uh, bags or, you know, things to, you know, load supplies in or whatever it is in, in your overland world. You're not going to find that many things in one place anywhere. Absolutely. In the words of Overland Expo, there's no other event that offers the scope of classes taught and uh, vendors shown. Correct. And I agree with that statement. Yep. Um, next thing I want to talk about is happy hour, which goes on each evening. Uh, this is something I feel like everyone should experience at least one evening if they're going to attend the event. Um, the lines went extremely fast. There was, there was no one complaining about the line. The line was absolutely long, but once yeah. you got in line, minutes later, you were, you were getting a beverage. Uh, so I, I want to put that out there Two, They also had, if you remember food right there in the happy hour. So you didn't have to leave out from happy hour to get something to eat after you drink. Yeah. Numerous food trucks within the, the gated uh, alcohol restricted area. Yeah. And I also noticed that the tent for the happy hour was far bigger than it's ever been. Yeah. Uh, which is a, which is a plus. It's also a good place to be an oasis during the day away from the sun. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to mention all kind of little details because people ask me. Yep. Yeah. That's kind of, plus. I mean, uh, the happy hour, I would recommend from just a perspective of, like you said, the line, maybe a little bit long. I hate waiting in line. That's just my thing. It did move fast. I would agree. Uh, but it's a great place to meet all sorts of people while you're standing in line, you know, going opposite ways. They already got their beverage. They're going, you know, whatever. So while you're standing there, you're, you're sort of, it's a meet and greet. And that's, that's probably, I mean, for me, that's, that's the number one thing about Overland Expo is to, is to run into people that, you know, meet new people and, and, you know, recognize, maybe you don't even know them. You just recognize them from Instagram or wherever you recognize them from. Um, but that's a good place to bring them all together every day. Right. And, and maybe you've noticed this too. Uh, people change at happy hour. Um, they, they're kind of uh, more social than they are during the actual event at happy hour. Uh, people are seem like they're decompressing. Mm -hmm. um, For many of us, we've spent the entire day either talking or being an instructor, uh, like, like yourself going around and doing uh, filming. Uh, doing interviews uh, as an attendee, you're going to classes, you're looking at products, you're walking up and down. I mean, I think at by five o'clock, everybody's, everybody's like, okay, well, I need to let my hair down a little bit. <laughs> you know? Yes, I agree. It's nice. So I always look forward to the happy hour because without fail, I've always met someone new, someone who is still in my life in some form or fashion. Um, I've always overheard a conversation and learned something and I've always had fun. So if you go to this thing, do not just go to the vendor area. Do not just have your schedule of classes and go to your class. At least one day, go to happy hour. It'll yep. benefit you. Yep. That, that would be my advice to mix it up. 
you know, I know years past, way back 10 years ago, I, would, I, I signed up for such a course load of going to, uh, you know, just going, hopping around, going to class after class after class. All great, but do yourself a favor and mix it up. Do a little class, a little vendor, a little social, you know, a little watch. The, if you're not doing the off-road section, go and watch it a little bit. Take a, take a walk, go through the motorcycle corral. You know, a lot of different people out there, a lot of interesting things to see. So, um, yeah, don't don't get overly committed to any one thing. I mean, because it's 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 so, just so big, you know. And, and since you mentioned the motorcycle corral, because we don't we don't give enough uh, to the two wheel uh, part of the community. And I just want people to know if they're interested in maybe maybe they've watched uh, films of people on journeys on their vehicle, uh, on their two wheel journeys, uh, but you don't know how to ride, they'll teach you how to ride at Overland Expo. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. want to, I just want to mention. That. And, and, and if you're an expert rider or you're, you know, really into uh, adventure bikes and, and going out and exploring on two wheels, Overland Expo is the best place for that too. I mean, the, the, the I was amazed at the, the uh, level of vendors that uh, in the motorcycle vendor section uh, and the amount biggest, of I think ever biggest I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, Saturday night, they had their uh, motorcycle uh, VIP party, uh, a separate dinner that you can buy tickets to. Uh, there, there was a lot of, a lot of two wheeled in, in you know, and, and being one myself, uh, I, I spent the weekend, I used my motorcycle a couple of times to go to the auto parts store for some friends that were having some truck difficulties. So that was the extent of my two wheel uh, adventure for the weekend. But, um, but yeah, if you're a motorcycle person, uh, Overland Expo is, is just as good for two wheels as it is for. Absolutely. And some of the biggest rock stars in that segment mm -hmm. are there. Yeah, in some ways, I, I think there were bigger rock stars from the two wheel community than the four wheel community. Almost. I agree. Yeah, a lot. Def, of them. That's that's true. I agree yeah. with that. Um, so let's stay with the evening. Um, you can go to happy hour. I suggest you go to happy hour. Uh, but if that's not your thing, fine. But I also suggest you go to the film festival. Yep. This year, you know, we were running around like crazy. So I didn't get to go to any of the film festivals. So I can't speak about the films this year. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually, uh, that's a loss for me because uh, some of the best cinematography that you'll ever see, some of the best storytelling that you'll ever see. And I'm including uh, movies that you've watched at a theater. Uh, some, yeah. We have some very talented nomadic people out there yeah and if you are looking for inspiration please go to the film festival portion of this uh have you ever uh watched anything at these film festivals have you ever gone i have i didn't have the opportunity to this year uh either but um in the past years yes I, i've done some some fantastic stuff e even some of the uh, the slideshow presentations that you'll get from people's trips that they've done uh, in different parts of the world. And, uh, but the film thing is like Phil said, is, is top quality. So if that's your thing, um, I, you know, try to get in there and, and, and see that as well. Um, I, I, I picked up some of, I heard some of, what, uh, of it. I didn't go to it um, from, I was on a couple panels and there was some chatter. And one, in fact, uh, somebody on one of my panels had done a film was part of the film thing. And um, yeah, yeah, I heard some cheering. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, one thing I like about you, Mike, one thing we have in common, we're social animals. Uh, we seek out the social elements of things to enjoy our time. And often when we think, when we're talking about it, we're always talking about us and what we get out of it and the fun and, and things like that. But another element of social is being charitable, is, is giving and yeah. your satisfaction being in that that person received. And one of the notable things about going to Expo is each evening they have charities, yeah. uh, charities that uh, you can in advance 
uh, buy tickets to or send money into, and then they accept during the actual event. So if your social the raffle, the includes raffle. giving, there are, there are charitable uh, organizations being given to by the event. So your money isn't just going to nothing. That's right. That's right. Yep. And, and, and that also, not only the charity side of it, that your money is also going to um, the education component, which teaches people to be respectful of, uh, you know, of travel and the, and the wilderness and, and respecting locations and, and uh, you know, different parts of the visit uh, and not to impact the, you know, the environment. So there's a, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of this coming together, if you will. Um, I agree. A lot of components to it. I agree. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about, well, not the last thing, but the next thing is, um, about the education. Yeah. Um, which you have something to, to do with. We, we talked about it a lot on the last podcast, but I, I don't feel like, um, we could talk about it too much. Now, according to the official stats, they had over 175 different classes and 300 hours of, of uh, training available, which is just crazy. So there's no way that you can take every class. Uh, no. It's that many. Um, I want an instructor to, to explain why you should be taking classes at Overland Expo. Uh, well, from my perspective, it's the best and quickest way to find out real live information about what you're seeking. So I, I'll give you an example. I, I did a thing with um, uh, a woman, it's two of us had done a panel. I call it a panel, there's two of us talking about Baja. So these are people that are interested in going down to Baja, Mexico uh, in the near future. And we had just come back, both of us had to come back from spending time down there all winter. And the questions that come in are like legit, questions so if you're in the audience and somebody asks you know is it safe to go to Baja well we can give you that answer uh, uh, from our perspective of being there but all these other people that are here are, are benefiting from hearing that answer and you know so the education component is important it puts in some ways uh, that using that as an example it 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 takes away some of the myths that you've heard like Oh, I know I can't go down to Baja. You know, I'm going to get my head chopped off, or, or you know, whatever that is. Um, but you know, uh, the education thing is so important because if you're worried about solo travel, or uh, you know, what recovery gear you should have, or you know, how difficult it is is to get my truck through uh, the Western African countries. You know, uh, how do I get a carnet for my vehicle? Or you know, you name it. The topics are so wide reaching so you can really plug yourself into what you are interested in or what you're about to do so it, it's enormously important you mentioned Baja and it triggered something in me I, I want to be I want to also give another side of this of this training thing I've gone to other events that are supposed to be like an expo or a rally and they've they have trainings um and they may have somebody that's talking about Alaska or they'll be talking about Baja, but they'll be talking about a trip they took 10 years ago. And they've been going around to these little events for 10 years, selling books and talking about something they did 10 years ago. Whereas typically at Overland Expo, the person talking to you yeah. either just returned from the trip like weeks or months ago, or they're still on the trip and they've flown in to report yes. and then they're going to go back and finish their trip. So right. the information is timely. It, it's the latest info, which is a big deal when you're crossing borders. Yeah. So and there's no comparison. Some top rate people to do the instruction. It's not just, I mean, most of the time, you know, ha having not only instructed things, but gone to other people's uh, classes. Th these people know what they're talking about. They're not getting on, 
you know, they're not just sort of, yeah, kind of, you know, I might've went there, you know, like, like Phil said, I might've went there 10 years ago and I kind of breezed through there, but you know, I, I must be an expert on this now. It's that, that, that isn't the case. So, um, you know, and, and the, and then the other thing, what I really like about the way Overland Expo in particular does it is that not only are they getting the right people to do uh, the classes, almost everybody that I've ever met there, all the instructors are very accessible. So meaning that the class comes to an end and I, I usually, I let me look at my schedule. I know if it's a 50 minute, they're all 50 minute classes. If it's 50 minutes, you know, I block two hours out of that because I know I'm going to be talking to people after the, the class uh, room session ends for another hour, probably, you know, on a personal level or they stop. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people came by, the, you know, where my truck was parked to ask me stuff that they had seen earlier that I had uh, been involved with. So, that uh, the 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 team of people that Overland Expo brings in are very accessible. You know, they're not I just agree. coming in and dipping out, and that's it. You know, last year ever hear of them. You know, and a lot of them have been doing it for many years too. And I've I've taken these classes, I've taken the wor workshops, and all of that. I like the kind of information they give. Like I, like I said, I've gone other places and taken classes and it sounds like they're reading out of photos, a photos book or something, or, or a uh, Alaska mile post or, or something. You know what I mean? Yes, uh, just I giving me these, these general facts. Yep. And yep. when I've gone to the same kind of classes at Expo, I mean, the people are giving me like little small little things, but things mm -hmm. that make, will actually make a difference in my trip. Yeah. Um, One of the changes, just while you're on the subject about the classes, because uh, they, they made a, a, a different type of class this year, which they called, yeah, I, I'm not even sure what they called it. It was under these little bivvies. So, so these little tents, and it was like casual chairs and places to plug your phone in and charge and sort of like just relax. It was very informal with less, um, most of the, one, the ones I saw and the ones I was involved in, it had less, um, it was less of a panel. In, in past years, we, we had panels where we had, you know, discussing a particular topic, you had eight of us, you know, up in front of the room along a table. This was sort of, this year they introduced this concept where it was kind of like just come and, you know, sit around a group and, and, and talk, about, talk ideas. And I think that was very effective. So I, I'm hoping they can doing that in the future that that was new this year i i agree uh, and it makes the listeners more relaxed and being more relaxed you absorb better and you'll come up with better questions yeah more questions yeah the, right. the, they're less shy you know kind of it was yeah it was more informal yep all right enough of the school stuff i don't i'm i, I uh i want to get to the party do you know what party I'm talking about, Mike? I do, because so Phil and I are very serious people and we get out there and we interact and we did some filming and we and we taught and we, we you know, we went to classes. But then we like to bring in the nighttime component, the, the place to be at Overland Expo, the fun, uh, which which, by the way, goes right back to like drawing people together to meet them to share ideas and stories and no better way than doing that is to host a party around a tempo tusk scottle and uh invite i don't know you invite 50 people and 200 come and <laughs> right and uh every year we we've been we've been growing this thing so we call it now that i don't know i guess i don't know what the name of the party is we can the, party. Party. the party the party yeah, it's the party, right? Am I if yep. I'm exaggerating? Call me out. It's the party every year, every event. That's right. Um. So for those who weren't fortunate enough to be there, I think we had one of the greatest LED light shows ever at one of these type of events. Uh, thanks to the Wander Box. Uh, who who not only light show. There was a laser light show and uh, a concert, if you will, because they had the, you know, the speakers and we had the music, we had the, the people, we had the food. We and, had uh, delicious food. We had all types of food. What, uh, what do we have? Chicken tacos, steak tacos, um, shrimp. 
shrimp, we had shrimp, shrimp. Um, refried you know, beans. I know at one point I knew we were going, you know, downhill and then it went uphill because we go, oh no, we ran out of, um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, the, the taco, the taco, the, the, yeah, the tortillas. We're like, oh no, we don't have any more tortillas. And somebody said that. And next thing you know, there were eight different groups came over and we had to stack this tall. <laughs> I was like, that's more tortillas than we started with. <laughs> and, and Mike, like I told so, you then, you know you've thrown a big party. You know you've thrown the party when you've already got a huge party going, right? But then there's little groups of satellite groups of people hanging around your party. They don't know you, but they want to be there. We So we had like satellite parties around our party. And I thought that was just cool. And even if people so, went to other parties, because we had a bunch of people say, yeah, I'm not going to mention the names of the other parties, but we had a bunch of people say, yeah, we just left there and we just left there and we just left there. So even if they didn't start the party with us, everybody pretty much ended the party with us. Yep. Yep. It was, uh, if, if you're going to the next expo, make sure you come and find wherever the big orange truck might be located. And uh, that'll be the home of the next party. And jerry showed up to the party you know it, it's traditional that all the food is cooked on a scottle so you would have thought that he would have been to one of these sooner but this was the first one yeah, yeah jerry from <laughs> tumbo tusk showed up and not only did he show up but you know he showed up with the whole tumbo tusk gang in their onesies so right they were dressed uh, like funny. elephants they were dressed like elephants it was yeah yeah i don't know I don't even so, know. We can't even tell you all the details. What I can tell you, you know, I also know it's a good party when the next morning you got to take the trash can of all of the uh, the beverage bottles and cans and whatnot and dispose of them correctly. And it, it, it I almost needed a tractor. <laughs> With that said, we got to thank everybody who helped us uh, yeah. bring in tables and chairs. People helped clean. People helped cook. Uh, it amazed me how so many people were invested in the success for our party. <laughs> and I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Shout out to Overland Gear for, for all the help that they gave us. Uh, Overland they were Gear fun. Guy. To be Overland Gear Guy. They were hilarious. Yeah. yeah. In fact, they, they did most of the cooking. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yep. Yep. So yep. Shout I had to everybody. Them. Uh, camp uh for sure everybody everybody contributed both both uh cooking and food and beverages and everything else so yeah it was fun so i had to talk about the the the, the party i had to bring that up because we talk so much about the social aspects of things so i just want everybody to know we're practicing what we preach <laughs> that's right uh, that's right which brings me to why do i focus so much on that well, we haven't really gotten into a conversation about it yet, but from going to the event this year, I have a lot of plans that um, I have uh, in the future coming up that come from socializing at the event. I have people that I plan on meeting in different places, uh, at different events, doing different things, and it all stems from just hanging out and socializing at the expo. So you guys, you guys can't see it right now, but I'm uh, at a, a friend's in Montrose, Colorado, and uh, outside my window are uh, a number of over Overland rigs, and two of which uh, I met are here that I met at Overland Expo. So that's exactly how that works. Okay, so I have a little, the camera is facing here. I'm looking at you over here in the screen. And I have a little note above my camera because I wanted to remind myself of this. And it says convincing Mike to attend Overland Expo Pacific Northwest. So that's what this part of the podcast is about to be about is convincing Michael from Drive the Globe to attend Overland Expo Pacific Northwest. Now, Phil, do we get to have our Saturday night? party oh 
that's how it, it you, if you don't show up that means you didn't show up to the party it's gonna be a party you better show up this is tough now this is getting tough okay so for for those out there listening who don't know when it's going to be it's going to be july 8th at the beautiful Deschutes County Expo Center, which is about 20 minutes away from the center of Bend, Oregon. And if you don't know anything about Bend, Oregon, this is like an epicenter of outdoor activities in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, people come from all around the world to Bend, Oregon, uh, to start their outdoor adventures, to start the beginning of uh, their travel. Um, there are a couple of very popular breweries in downtown Bend and a coffee shop that are famous among uh, international overland travelers that when they're traveling through Oregon, they stop there. So I just wanted to mention that. And if you don't know anything about the actual place it's going to be at, it's uh, over 340 acres it's more than big enough to accommodate an Overland Expo and do it right. Uh, and I also want to mention that I don't care where you're coming from. You can create a beautiful trip to Bend, Oregon. I don't care where you live. If you doubt me, send me a DM and I'll give you a travel itinerary. So do I need to keep going? Are you coming? Interesting fact, never have been to Oregon. There's only yeah, that four just states blows there. my mind. Four states in the United States I've never been to, Oregon and Washington. And all over the world, ain't been to Oregon. Nope. So so that in itself should get me there. Uh, so that that's what I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards that. Yes, I'm, I'm definitely. I'm, uh, okay. Now, you know, that's my area. I plan on showing out. Yeah. You don't that want to miss this one. Worth it. That's going to be worth it just to go for that. And um, according to what they say that um, they're going to have almost as many vendors, almost as many instructors and stuff going on. So this isn't going to be like a step down to go to the Pacific Northwest. And I want to give you some inside information living in the area. I know most of the vendors. I know most of the the big social media content creators that live in this area. I know everybody and everybody is so, uh, we have chips on our shoulders about not getting attention in this area and everybody plans on doing something big. So I, I can't guarantee what's gonna happen at Overland Expo two, but the first one is gonna be amazing, I promise you. And I think that's actually an advantage of this. And in some cases, sometimes first year events are not, but I think there's been so much discussion about this one. And obviously it's not a first time event for the organization, but it's a first time at that location. And I think that location has been, uh, it's a huge amount of pent up demand over the years. So I think that this is, I, I totally agree with Phil that this is gonna be a big one. It's probably gonna be their biggest new event launch that they've ever had you know you know it, it, meaning that uh, uh, for a first year i think that the success at that one is going to be infinitely higher than their first year at any of the other locations so uh, i absolutely I, agree yeah I absolutely I, I, agree i can um, definitely see that I, 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 and i've talked to so many people that are going in fact phil is not the only guy out there that's trying to convince me to go there i'm getting that from all sides <laughs> Be there or be square. That's right. The other one I want you to go to uh, is called the Northwest Overland Rally in my home state, which is uh, Washington. It's in Plain, Washington, which is about two and a half hours from me. Um, now, this is a smaller event. So you've never been to that one either, right? I have not. I know those are, I've never been to Washington. So here's the thing. I know how much you, you enjoyed Vermont Overland Rally. If you loved that one, you're going to love this one. That's, yeah, that's, I, like, uh, that's, I, I prefer, you know, just as a selfish personal thing, I prefer the smaller, more intimate events anyways, um, just because it's my motivation of going is always talking to 
people. So, I mean, I find it a little bit easier to do it there, but. If, yeah. if the bigger events are, are claustrophobic to you, if you're only wanting to just hang out a little bit, uh, if you're looking for a fun local time, there's nothing on this side of the map. There's nothing to compete with it. I'm not going to mention the other names of other events, but if you're watching this and you're saying, well, what about, yeah, that one too. It's not, it's, it doesn't compare. Whatever one you bring up, it doesn't compare. The only one I can think of that's on the same level is the Vermont Overland Rally. And you said it has a new name now. Now called the pilgrimage. Yeah. The pilgrimage. I, I, I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but um, that's the East coast equivalent. I think of what, what we're talking about. So how are you liking Colorado? Love it. I love it. I mean, I've been to Colorado a number of times. I've not spent a ton of time here on the Western side. Um, I, I did do a couple off-road trips in my past on the Western side, but um, not, not too much recently. So this is different. Uh, you know, it's a little cold the last couple of days here for me, from my uh, warm-blooded Baja and uh, Arizona, New Mexico areas. Uh, and we hope to head out. We're heading out as a group in the next couple of days. Uh, I think on Wednesday, we're going to go over to Utah to a uh, sort of an undisclosed sort of very remote location to, to just hang out for a couple of days and get some good uh, video and, and pictures maybe and see what happens. So it sounds like uh, even if you're even even if you are heading back east, you're not in a rush to get back east. No, I definitely going to commit to doing that in the, you know, over the next week. I'll be in Utah. I, I have been invited to go to a uh, another gathering that's up in uh, Wyoming, in mm -hmm. the Wind River area of Wyoming, which I am not familiar Unless with. Unless you're talking about something private, I got an invitation to that too. No, it's not private. No, it's, it's the uh, Wind River. Um, Wind River uh, Rally, yeah. I believe it's called. Yeah, it's sort of a van life overland uh, event. It's run by a uh, Josiah guy that I know pretty well. I met down in Baja, actually. And uh, and I and I had come from before Overland Expo. I had gone to an event down in Bisbee, Arizona, that he had put on. That was that was awesome. On Instagram, is he Isaiah HQ or something like that? Josiah Q, and okay. his uh, he is um, he runs the Journal of Lost Time. So you can follow them on Instagram, Journal of Lost Time. We just and, started following each other, yeah. and uh, we actually were speaking in the DMs. And I didn't yep. know who he was. And now, yep. now um, it's coming yeah. full so circle. I, I hung out with him in Baja and then uh, went to uh, meet him in Bisbee, Arizona. And uh, he's actually, right, I believe right now, he's actually down in Argentina. He has uh, bought some property down in Argentina, down in uh, Patagonia area. But um, yeah, he's running those events. And I like his, I like his events because they're very uh, informal, casual, great group of people come in. In, that are representing many different areas of what I would call the overland segment. So I, I do like that. What are the dates for that? Yeah, I don't know. June. It's in June. I'd have to look. Okay. I'm not positive. Okay. Yeah, I, I totally, being honest, I had totally dismissed it because I hadn't heard of it, but now I have a, a different thought process about it. Yeah, yeah. So do you know how, do you know what's next after uh, going to Utah or that's as far as you figured it out? As far as I figured it out. So my, my big thing right now is deciding to stay, uh, whether I'm going to stay out West for uh, the summer or I'm going to go East. My, 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 my original plan was to be in, uh, in the Northeast between uh, July and October for three months there. Um, and as everybody knows, the price of fuel and uh, everything else, you know, and knowing that I have to be back out west to head that back down to Mexico in the fall is weighing on my mind. So I've been thinking about options. There's a lot, obviously, there's a lot to do. I mean, I love, don't, don't get me wrong, I love it in the east, I love it in the west. So it's, uh, you know, it's good to try to figure it's, uh, it's what's on my mind right now. So that, that made me think of a question for you with this gas. The gas is crazy. It's uh, crazy. In Montana, when I was in Montana a few days ago, I paid $5.25 a gallon. 
and typically Montana has been low usually in the past. And I said the lowest fuel prices right now that I've seen, and I, obviously I've only been out west here, uh, but talking to people around the country is right here in Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, five twenty a gallon for diesel here, which is which is forty or fifty cents less than I was paying in Arizona or New Mexico for sure. Uh, so I, I, yeah, the fuel is really a consideration. Um, but I, I, you know, I mean, not to get way off tangent, but the the, the fuel, as, as everybody out there knows, is not just about driving. It's about when you go to the grocery store and you buy a steak or a hamburger or chicken or eggs or a bit, toothpaste for that matter, anything that gets moved around by a, a truck, which is diesel based, uh, you know, or, or, or goes on a train, which is also diesel based. So the shipping is interesting. And that, you know, that's, I think we've talked about that. And the other thing was, you know, why am I sitting here today and not in South America somewhere? It goes back to, it, it is rooted around uh, largely fuel and shipping. You know, and, and that's 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 been a challenge for uh, nomadic people, definitely. Whether whether you're nomadically moving around in a, in a geographic area in the United States or you're trying to get around the world, it's affecting things. And, and that's exactly where I was headed. I wanted to ask you: Have you heard from any of your friends? Maybe uh, has the cost of fuel changed their plans? Uh, significantly, I know a lot of people. Maybe they stay. They stay in certain places longer. Um, has yeah. anyone? Have you heard a story yet from someone where it's it's significantly altered their yes. trip? Yes, even more significantly than possibly altering the actual travel part. I've heard of at least two people that I know very well that are actually changing or in the process of changing the vehicle that they go. Uh, mm -hmm. around in because of the fuel um you know uh, obviously a truck like mine a larger overland rig or something that uses more fuel is going to be less uh less friendly <laughs> in, in these times so yeah i do know people that are looking at uh, alternative options for better fuel mileage uh vehicles um and I, yeah i've heard a, a couple of people also changing travel plans de definitely yeah yeah the, uh what made me want to ask that was is because uh, i use one of those fuel calculators for my big trips and um for my next big trip i i keep in inputting the new highest price and there's been a thousand dollar increase in my fuel cost for this trip yeah that that is that's significant yes yeah I, I, particularly I, I could for, do a lot with that a lot yeah it, yeah and that's the thing is then it starts coming down to choices between doing something and paying for fuel um and that that is a that is an interesting perspective so i don't know where that's going to end uh or uh, you know what's going to happen and, and it isn't just so here's the interesting thing. It, it's it depending on what kind of travels you're doing. It depends on uh, Mexico is a good example of this. The fuel prices there have actually dropped slightly um, and they're running much, much lower than the United States. So um, yeah, and that may be affected. So, so somebody may decide, well, you know, I'm not going to do that trip across Canada this summer uh, or, or, or going into the fall. I was going to go, you know, on a trans Labrador Newfoundland trip. I'm going to go to Baja now. Well, yeah, I could see that happening because uh, the price of fuel in Canada compared to the price of fuel in Mexico is night and day. Mm -hmm. So there, there may be decisions like that. And, uh, you know, that's, I, I'm not a fan of that. Um, and I don't know that I would even switch a, a vehicle based on that because as we know, everything's kind of fickle, right? So, yeah. you know, we wait 20 minutes and it was price of fuel might be a dollar a gallon. Who knows? Well, this is the first year where I've, you know, we've, we've had spikes in, in gas prices before. I remember the jump from $2 to like three and a half dollars. And this is the first one where I'm really feeling it. Yep. The first time I'm really feeling it. And I would agree for two reasons. One, really feeling it because it's significant and it's affecting all the commodities. Everything. But two, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer here, but I also feel like 
this problem is not a blip and it's not going away that quickly. And I'm concerned. In fact, I, I'm greatly concerned that it's going to get worse. So, uh, well, we're thinking the same. Yeah. I, I, I get a different feeling. I've seen these before the blips and things and up and down. We, you know, we complain it's the summertime. We got to drive somewhere, but that's more than that. I'm thinking that even if a uh, Canadian, let's just say North America, Mexico, United States, Canada, even if we get our prices down, I'm not so sure about internationally where it's never really been down. No. And it's way higher. Like in Europe right now, it is staggeringly expensive. So, so yeah. I, I'm thinking that, uh, as far as significant changes in travel, I think a lot of international plans are going to just go to the wayside because it's going to just not be feasible. Mm -hmm. And the price, price of airfare because of the fuel is, is also going up pretty rapidly right now. So you're, you know, if you were planning on shipping a truck and driving to something, uh, that was bad. But now flying there is also bad. Uh, you know, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. I, I don't. I don't know. It's gonna be. It's gonna be an interesting uh, couple of years, I think. And this is like post-pandemic, but it, in some ways, it's like. I don't. It almost. It could be worse. I mean, it, this could be a. It, this could turn into a worse issue than we had even before. Mm -hmm. And as far as the the containers, like you're talking about shipping, I mean, if if I was a shipping company and I had the choice between shipping your vehicle and shipping a container full of iPads, I'm shipping the iPads. I'm, I can, I, it's far more uh, profitable to me. So- And the, and the problem is, is that, um, you know, that market is, is upside down right now because of, you know, a lot of people don't understand how the shipping, shipping works. So boats go two directions. They come in and then they leave and they go back. When you have an imbalance of trade, which is really what set a lot of this off, where uh, China was buying a lot of our metal, um, you know, scrap metal and stuff, and the containers were coming over here with iPads in them, and then going back with metal in them. Well, now they're not they're not purchasing this right now. So what's occurring is is that we can't send the boat back empty. It doesn't work. That doesn't float the same way. It doesn't. It would sink. So uh, you get we got a stockpile of containers sitting up in in you know off the. California and wherever else. And now we have a reduction of containers. So now that we want those iPads, we've got no boats over on the other side of the world to bring the iPads to us because there's no con the containers sitting over here empty. That's part of it. And then like m where it affected me is pulling, pulling actual ships off of routes to try to fix the problem somewhere else. And now I want to ship my truck from South America to Africa. Well, that route effectively doesn't even exist anymore right because the boat is no longer doing the route the boat is going between singapore and la now um you know so that that's causing and then, then there, there's obviously there's a backlog of issues that that causes so you know in the price of things and then that, and that's the other problem Get, getting products is because what's happening is that people are bidding on the way that that way the containers work is that you book containers in advance you pay an x fee uh, it's all settled. You fill your container up, gets on the boat, it gets loaded. Well, the price of fuel is going up so quickly and so drastically that, um, you know, the, the, the shipping company is struggling with this because they, uh, you know, when they contract the price and then when it actually goes, all of a sudden they're losing money because the price of fuel went up so high. So they're pre-bidding out at higher prices, which is driving the market. All, it's going all over the place. There, there's a lot of challenges to the shipping and resupply and shortages of stuff. It's, it's way more complicated than people. I mean, everybody wants to just go, oh, it had to do with COVID. Mm. And not a lot. You, you were mentioning the back and forth of the, the cargo um, boxes. Uh, a, another angle or aspect of that is, I, I know someone personal, personally who has quadrupled their income. They're a truck driver. They quit their job that they had been working for years. They leased a um, a truck, and now they're making money pulling these empty uh, crates because they're so um, wanted that 
he's making money just driving these things to where they need them because they don't have enough of them. They used to have yep. too many of them. Now they don't have enough of them. And yep. he's literally quadrupled his income yep. just driving these containers where they need them because they yep. need them so desperately. Yep. yep. That's crazy. It's crazy. And then and some of the ports have gotten backlogged where they got the, there's too many containers in one place and not enough in another, and they don't have enough land storage for them. So now they, they like you said, they're, they're going to ship them off of site to go somewhere else. Well, what does this do? Drives up the cost of stuff, right? So, you know, now you're, you know, everything is going up and, yeah. and then exponential because, because of this, of the increased traffic and the price of diesel going up, it just increases everything exponentially. So we're, we're, we're all in a, you know, a mess. And, and why I brought up that angle was, is there are people who are actually uh, profiting like never before. So everyone does not have an incentive for things to go back the way they were. That's another reason why I'm concerned about it. Yeah. 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 People it's always think, money is made uh only in good situations when it's actually quite the opposite yep it's a supply and demand thing too i saw an interview uh yesterday the day before of the uh, ceo of flying j and pilot you know the the big i get i, I didn't realize this they control uh 24 of the diesel market in the united states and 30 something percent of the def the diesel exhaust fluid uh, because they own a large percentage of the large truck stops on the highways. Okay. And uh, they are having an issue getting fuel. So, so their providers that they're getting fuel from are telling them they need to cut uh, their purchasing because they can't, get, they can't supply them. So it's obviously it's supply and demand, right? So it sends the, the cost of the product up, with, in this case, diesel. And uh, they, you know, they, they want to get more fuel to provide for the truckers. And they're getting squeezed. So, yeah, <laughs> we're all going to be sitting in our trucks, not moving. <laughs> I, I hate it going into this miserable direction, but it is a part of travel. Yes. So really. I'm trying not to always give rosy colored uh, stories to people, uh, even though I'm trying to inspire people to get out and do things. I don't want to be remiss in not mentioning the challenges in front of you. Yep. Uh, I know people who are retired on fixed income and they think they, they thought they had pretty much everything set for, and these changes are changing their life. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And you know, and you notice, like you said, uh, you know, in past times you didn't notice it specifically as much, but it like, was an I irritant. It was an irritant. Now I go, I used to fill this tank that I'm sitting in here. I'm inside my truck right now. $250 cost me 500 now. That's double. And do, if you don't think you feel $250 difference every time you go to the gas station, you do. Oh, God. I can't imagine paying that. But I couldn't imagine paying 100 I, I spent $101.65 on this last trip on one of my Phillips. I, I've never seen three digits before. <laughs> Being a Jeep owner, I know because the tank, I mean, isn't that big. Right. So it's, it's yeah, that's a lot of money to put in a Jeep for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And I don't have the range that you, you got. So it's, I'm, I'm back at the gas station in a few hours if I'm on the road. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it adds up. I mean, that's the bottom line. It adds up. So. Well, it's been another great podcast with you, Mike. Absolutely. I basically just had to make the decision that we're going we're gonna to end here because I know we'll end up talking too long. That's right. We don't want to do that. We and, have lots of stuff to talk about on other episodes. Right. And we'll get too comfortable and start breaking the rules and saying stuff we don't need to say. <laughs> That's right. Well, We'll talk some more offline. I want to talk to the audience real quick. And what I want to say is, I hope everybody's enjoying the podcast. I hope you are enjoying the inclusion again of my friend, Mike from Drive the Globe. Please follow him. Please like him. 
uh, there's a lot to learn and know from him. So I'm looking forward to having him reoccurring. We haven't decided how often that'll be, but I'm looking forward to whenever he wants to come on the pod. You have been listening to Waypoint Overland's Random Waypoints. Like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more.